you're on video. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the launch of the journal Manifest, a journal of the Americas, which is an independent print publication edited by Anthony Akiabati, Justin Fowler, and Dan Handel. Founded as a means to initiate a critical and imaginative conversation about the states of American architecture. Hello, everybody. Um, it's cities to the and its launch of the journal Manifest, Manifest tackles head on journal what others have abandoned. While Manifest intends to question the assumptions behind singular notions and constructions of America by tracing its origins and its global influence, the journal also strives to define the uniqueness of American forms of city building and the distinct set of political parameters through which these forms are shaped. Manifest is an independent print publication dedicated to exploring the art, architecture, and landscape of the Americas. So I will now introduce two of Manifest's founding editors that we have with us today who will moderate the conversation. Antonia Chiavati and Dan Handel. Antonia Chiavati works at the intersection of architecture and the history of science and technology. He's, a train, he's trained in architecture, geography, and history of science, and he's the author of the award-winning book, Ganges Water Machine, Designing New India's Ancient River. The founding editor of Manifest, he's a principal of Somatic Collaborative in New York, and the Daniel Rose Visiting Assistant Professor in Urban Studies at Yale University. Dan Handel is an architect and curator whose work focuses on research-based exhibitions with special attention to underexplored ideas, figures, and practices that shape contemporary built environments. He's a founding editor of Manifest as well. Today, Anthony and Dan will moderate the conversation uh, between authors Lydia Zinogala on future fossils and Enrique Ramirez on Elysian fields in the Americas. The issue that we will be discussing and launching today is issue number three, entitled Bigger Than Big. With the description, uh, with the, uh, per the words of the authors, what does it mean to grapple with the immensity of the Americas? For the third issue, Manifest, a Journal of the Americas, we aim to highlight propositions that have taken seriously the bigger than big design and representational experiments aimed at narrating, framing, or enacting the American continent and the forms and ideas which it animates. If today's symbolic landscapes are decidedly more urban and characterized by their managerial metrics, walkability, sustainability, density, intelligence, etc. An issue here is the stubborn persistence of physical and spatial immensity as animating and potentially humbling actors in the urban imaginaries of the Americas. Returning to this urgent familiar discourse with a new voice, we can address the deceptively simple challenge of the new world in its physical and material conditions. Three categories constitutes the issue's conceptual framework matter, scale, and description. Taken together, these avenues offer alternative readings into contemporary questions of cultural imaginaries and histories in relation to the deep time of geological formation and examine the continuing agency of physical matter in a moment dominated by the data sublime of virtual landscapes and smart cities, tracing back the impacts and multi-layered resonance of immensity in American design. So on that note, I would like to welcome um, Anthony Akiavati and Dan Handel to moderate the conversation and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Lydia. It's uh, really great to have the chance to do a remote launch of uh, Manifest Number 3 here at the Cooper. Um, we held uh, what was probably one of the most uh, I think successful events here several years ago here and there uh, actually because at the time of course it was a physical event uh, but still that uh, invigorating conversation is still in our minds uh, some years later so again great to be here 
Uh, we want to thank uh, Dean Nader Tehrani for hosting this event, you Lydia Kalipoliti for helping us organize the talk of the school, and Mauricio Iguera for uh, making sure everything works so seamlessly. Uh, we also want to thank designer Tal Erez, who's working with us behind the scenes for creating another striking set for this online event, which I hope you're uh, watching via uh, the YouTube channel of uh, the Kupi Union. Um, this is one of several events we're holding in Lima, Mexico City, Cambridge, Princeton, Charlottesville, Halifax, and many more. So we're mixing uh, time zones and geographies and online and physical in very interesting ways, perhaps fitting to our time. Um, I will begin by saying a few words uh, about Manifest beyond what Lydia was uh, uh, saying. Um, as you mentioned, it is an independent uh, print publication uh, dedicated to American space, if you may. It was founded by myself together with Antonio Chavadi and Justin Fowler with the original intention to initiate a critical and imaginative conversation about the Americas. Gradually, um, we came to realize that what we're doing is not a serial publication, not, a, not really a magazine, but rather a number of edited thematic volumes that allow both literary experimentation and analytical investigation. Uh, as the two contributors uh, that we have here, uh, Lydia and Enrique, uh, well attest, right? Their pieces are pretty much in that uh, vein. So in this context, our deliberate use of the term Americas is of special significance. Of course, the stuff of the continent transcends political borders, which expands our horizon from the plains of Patagonia to the Arctic Circle. And we use the plural as opposed to the singular because Americas also connotes the multiplicity of territories within an uneasy layering of environments, peoples, and ideologies. For us, this is not something that can be easily summarized in an executive brief or the platitudes of political speech. Instead, it requires a constant state of excavation, reflection upon, and reimagination. And we are indebted, literally and fiduciarily, to the support we have received from the Graham Foundation, Shankar College, anonymous donors and benefactors, as well as from a readership that extends across the globe from Thailand to Peru and from Canada to Australia. And while we maintain an active online presence, and I can't invite you enough to uh, look at our uh, website, we remain fiercely committed to the, print, to the print medium as a mode of exchange of ideas and experiences. The current vol volume number three, uh, titled Bigger Than Big, brings together 50 contributors and perhaps fitting with our subject uh, is our largest issue yet. We have asked these uh, contributors to consider immensity, as Lydia was mentioned, immensity as a driving force in the creation of American narratives of space. Um, now for today, um, we, we had a kind of different idea of what this uh, could be. If normally a launch event uh, would be dedicated to what was already established and printed in this case, the occasion of this evening's conversation is slightly different in our minds. Um, we have invited two of our contributors, Enrique Ramirez and Lydia Zinogala, to expand on their very compelling contributions to issue number three, uh, both of the texts, we believe, open up questions about the role of visual and textual description, particularly, particularly as mediators between material matter and matters of experience, themes that seem even more pressing to us now in the age of accelerated agreement and ideological echo chambers. So to that end, we will briefly introduce each of the speakers with the bios they shared with us describe their published piece, and then ask each of them a series of questions regarding the images they shared with us. Once we've asked our initial questions, we will be then happy to accept questions from the audience, uh, which is really what we believe Manifest is about, a well-produced and we hope well-thought-out excuse for meaningful conversations about the Americas. So first, I'd like to begin by introducing Lydia Zinogala. Born in Athens, Greece, Lydia is an architect and doctoral fellow at the ETH GTA Institute. Through her practice, Alus, she constructs architecture, landscapes, objects, and stories with projects that engage built artifacts, material culture, and the natural environment. Lydia's work on the relationship between chemistry, material cultures, and the built environment has been showcased at the Museum of Modern Art, Storefront for Art and Architecture, the Van Allen Institute, Society of Architectural Historians, 
Chemical Heritage Foundation, History of Science Society, and ACSA, among other venues. And next, I'd like to introduce Enrique Ramirez, who is a scholar and historian of modern and contemporary architecture and urbanism. He is at work on a manuscript entitled Lines of Least Resistance, Architectural Modernity, Human Flight, and the Modernization of Air, a study of the line drawing and line making techniques that reveal how exchanges between architectural and aeronautical cultures in 18th and 19th century France constructed new modernized ideas about air and the natural environment. So we'd like to ask you pretty much the same questions regarding your respective pieces uh, with the hope of, uh, you know, trying to, to start up a conversation that is not just a question and answer thing, but something that is perhaps more dynamic for today, uh, because we do feel that your pieces share some uh, affinities. So um, I'll begin with uh, Lydia, and in your piece uh, titled Future Fossils, you look at parallels and intersections between the architect and the archeologist. But if the work of the archeologist is often to uncover and retrieve fragments of the past, your text looks at an architecture meant to cover up large scale land operation in the, um, operations in the Americas, in particular two repositories for nuclear waste in North America the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and the Yucca Mountain in Nevada. Your incredible drawings and models uh, and text present us with a field guide to these uh, inaccessible, largely inaccessible sites, where you invite us to spelunk and explore these repositories as future generations might do. And Enrique, your text, Wallacea in Comium, follows a literary discovery as notes on immensity by David Foster Wallace are being exposed uh, by you in his archive. Wallace's distinct style and power of observation are gushing from this short text, which you wonderfully connect to your own musings on the presence and incongruency of immensity in the American experience. So I would like to begin by talking about the continent, that vast mass of land, which contains the traces of both geolo geological events uh, and eruptions of uh, human and animal activity as the frame of reference for today's conversation. So this is for the two of you, of course. How do you think we can use the continent operatively in order to negotiate the extremely long durée and the immediate experience in ways that could yield new narratives of space and the peoples that inhabit it? Whoever would like to start, now's the time. Sure, I can start. <laughs> um, so really um, the, the vastness of the continent and specifically the, the two sites that I've been writing about and just to say a little bit um, the, about them is uh, the first is the, um, the WIP or the Waste Isolation Power Plant that's uh, located in Carlsbad in uh, New Mexico. And uh, it's um, 600 meters below ground and it has a really deep history dating back to the Permian period, like uh, 250 million years ago. And it speaks about, uh, in this side, there used to be a sea that evaporated, but what it left behind is this nearly impermeable layer of salt. And over time, this layer of salt was covered with soil and rock. And now it's uh, what geologists call a host rock. And inside this rock, um, which is um, pure sodium chloride, um, so inside this rock, uh, it's hosting through layers and layers of concrete, uh, transuranic nuclear waste. So, um, and the second site, which is a, repo a proposed repository for the Yucca Mountain in Nevada, it has a very different geology altogether uh, because it's made out of volcanic ash and melt rock fragments. And inside those, uh, there are proposed ramps and tunnels um, again, to host uh, waste. So um, in writing about the continent and the immensity uh, as a call for this issue, I was uh, very interested in grafting a kind of like a geological continuum uh, between different processes of matter that uh, date from the Permian period 
but then processes that are taking place right now uh, and speak very much about contemporary culture. Um, and they both involve rocks. So these, these geologies and these rocks become, became for me the medium to connect time and connect uh, scale. So the, the text is really takes the format of a speculative field guide. So instead of uh, speaking about those sites as what they are now or what they can be, I write about them as these immense fossils that are found in the terrain. So I really treat them like matter that is encased in a rock. And I follow taxonomies and geological thinking to begin to unpack what they mean, what kind of information they contain as such as a fossil. Um, and I'm really interested in going back to the, the beginning of uh, geology as a science where savants would go out into the field and find uh, like the, the mammoth, uh, a fossil of a mammoth tooth and speculate about its origin, what environment caused its extinction. So I, I treat those, um, those sites uh, as really composite objects that are made out of both rock and also organic matter, and uh, they are a source of knowledge. Um, so depth and terrain uh, become the way to develop a narrative around them. Well, to to uh, uh, to follow up on those comments, just wanna just wanna say uh, thank you for including me in, t in this panel. Um, it's really my honor and my pleasure to be part of this. And I should also um, I should also begin by saying that my contribution to this p to this uh, issue of manifest is quite small uh, in this in this uh, in this uh, um, magazine this this publication that is uh, dedicated to the immensity. Uh, of you know of of scales and of landscapes uh, the way that we conceive of them my my contribution is quite small um, but uh, but uh, and as to follow up on what Lydia was saying like I sometimes feel like I am I am a savant that's kind of like uh, wandering into this like large this large field this large kind of constellation of discourses that all bring uh, that are all brought to bear. Uh, into this like uh, this issue of uh, this beautiful term weathering immensity. Now, when it comes to this idea of the continent, this is a question that's really near and dear to my heart, as it suggests that there is a physical and spatial dimension to the act of writing, not only in the, on the page, but in the terms of, in the way that we conceive of the very objects that we try to commit to the page. So hence the Greek uh, term topoi and its Latin counterpart uh, locus refer to arguments that are familiar or commonplace. Uh, and as we know, these terms have important implications for the writing of space or landscape. These two coinages from uh, classical antiquity, of course, give us topics and localities. But for those of us who are invested in writing um, as a way to negotiate space in, in geography, topoi and locus give us topographies and locations as well. Um, so I have two examples uh, of the ways in which we can use the continent uh, in order to, as you say, negotiate uh, the extremely long durée and yield new narratives of space uh, and the peoples that inhabit it. Uh, the first comes from, uh, from a novel that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, uh, the 1997 novel, Mason and Dixon by Thomas Pynchon. Uh, now I realize that this novel is not one that people immediately glom onto when they want to know, nor know more about narratives of space. You know, it's not for everyone. I mean, it's for me, but it's not for everyone. I don't know what that says about me. I don't know what that says about you, but I love the book. But um, anyway, it's a novel that conflates the practice and science of surveying with the telling of stories, with the writing of stories. Um, and in the novel, uh, one of the major figures in the novel is, is, is the 18th century mathematician, William Emerson, um, who teaches the astronomer, Jeremiah Dixon, um, uh, how to make maps. And Emerson describes maps uh, in the novel, he describes, he describes map, map, map making as, quote, a journey onward into a country unknown, an act of earth irrevocable as taking flight. So 
and the novel so map making is when you make a map you're literally flying over the landscape it's a way to take in the immensity of the landscape that's below you now the novel is written from the point of view of a character named wix cherry coke uh, who was part of in the novel was part of charles mason and jeremiah dixon's crew that was busy surveying the line that was eventually going to separate pennsylvania from maryland and in recalling these exploits cherry coke the main narrator in the novel tells us quote Facts are but the playthings of warriors, tops and hoops forever a spin. Alas, the historian may indulge in no such idle rotating. History is not chronology, for that is left to lawyers, nor is it remembrance, for remembrance belongs to the people. History can as little pretend to the veracity of the one as claim the power of the other. Her practitioners to survive must soon learn the arts of the quidnunc, spy, and taproom wit, that there may ever continue more than one lifeline back into a past. We risk each day losing our forebears in forever. Not a chain of single links, for one broken link could lose us all, rather a great disorderly tangle of lines, long and short, weak and strong, vanishing into the mnemonic deep, with only their destination in common. Now, the other example that I can think of is from an 1864 novel by Jules Verne, which is little read because it's actually his second novel. It's when he was just really starting to get his publishing career started. And it's called, uh, it's, uh, um, it's actually two novels, but when they were published in, a, in an omnibus volume, they were called The Adventures of, Ca of Captain Hatteras. This was published in 1864. And it's a novel about polar exploration, specifically the race to the North Pole. And much of, much of the action in the novel takes place in the Arctic seas above 70, 70 degrees northern latitude. Now, in the novel, and were we to place ourselves at 70 degrees north latitude, we would quickly realize that things look quite a bit different up there. So uh, I'm going to do a little bit to just imagine if you're a sailor above a ship above 70 degrees north latitude and you're trying to find a northwest passage you would have a different understanding of the land masses and the ice masses that flow around you and how um, how they operate how they behave and how you would commit your description of those land masses and ice flows to the page so so if you're up there at 70 degrees northern latitude, you'll know that there are days when the sea unfurls as a vast sheet of brilliant blue. On others, it is the color of wet ash, a gray directionless blur defined only by a distant mountain, a fog bank, or even an iceberg. And these are the most dangerous, of course, because when the air begins to warm in the spring months, so does the water around the icebergs. And there's some amount of melting uh, these giant fortresses of ice shed layers and they break apart into pieces. The wayward pieces drift into icy currents and choke the narrowest straits, making passage dangerous for any vessel, even those with iron prows in search of that elusive Northwest Passage. In written accounts by the earliest Arctic explorers, this search was anything but exciting. Um, Clue, uh, crews plunge into extended periods of abject boredom. Some expeditions were one-way voyages. Uh, ships left their ports, captains and crews celebrated, and their voyage continued until the reports stopped and the envoys no longer brought word of their progress. They disappeared only to be followed by more expeditions whose sole purpose was not to discover unknown lands, but rather to recover the remains of previous crews. Now, a sailor on one of these expeditions would stand watch, ice pick uh, in hand, and may notice stranger things floating along the sides of a boat. They may, there may be pieces of ice frosted with rings of red algae, or in the middle of a field of ice, the sailor may see a hole used by seals uh, for gulping air after a long dive. So the sailor uh, will be startled by one, dark bobbing up and down, and he reaches for it for an ice pick, praying that what he's seeing is not a human body. He brings it closer to the ship and now sees that it's part of a tree, 
with a branch that is still large, that, has, that still has large thin leaves that flop in the air like dry oil, oil cloth. And a short distance away, there's a piano floating on the surface of the water as well. Uh, one leg that sticks up into the water as if in a kind of rigor mortis. Now these things may have been thrown away or they may be the remnants from a shipwreck. Now this sailor on board this ship above 70 degrees north latitude may even imagine that these things may have been flung in the water in some faraway place like the tropics, Central America perhaps, where the jungle runs into the ocean. In a time of heavy rains, a river swells and overruns its banks. A wave of rushing muddy, uh, muddy water overruns, uh, overruns its banks um, and it carries houses off their foundations and throws them into the rocks. They burst into pieces, into pieces strewn about in rushing waters that empty into the ocean. A warm current takes over here, churning the mass of the debris with colder waters flowing upwards from the Southern hemisphere. It curves upwards, hugging the coast, moving up the parallels like rungs on a ladder, higher and higher they go to colder uh, realms. This debris field moves up along the Aleutian chain through the Bering Strait and drifting ever slow, slowly to the east. It turns south, another debris field that flows between huge seats of ice through a freezing, freezing ocean where a sailor lunges an ice pike into the water after seeing something strange floating in the waters before him. Right, so uh, evidence of the Northwest Passage is basically debris that originated in the Southern Hemisphere and went through the isthmus below or around the Horn and made it all the way up around the other side of the continent. So there were ways in which writers and explorers were kind of like trying to comprehend this kind of like immensity that is a continent uh, and trying to commit it to the written page. Well, and, and, and Enrique, that sets up so nicely what I, what I really would love to ask next because of the following those channels or as you put it, those disorderly tangle of lines that you just uh, laid before us and flotsam and jetsam. I think one way in which I see both of your pieces coming together though in markedly different ways is the way that you're exploring terrains emanating life and half-lives, maybe even half-truths as you just kind of touched upon with Jules Verne, for example. I'd love to hear you both speak about how you engage those murmurs and buzzing, maybe even gurgling of organic and inorganic matter within your pieces that you wrote for us in Manifest. I'll start. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's another really good question. And um, uh, the issue, this issue of half-truths, uh, it just reminds me of another passage from Mason and Dixon where Pynchon writes how, quote, skies grow thick with aviating swine. That is, pigs are flying in the novel, basically, basically saying that the novel could be one giant lie. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, more directly in terms of like organic and organic matter, uh, I recall that while in David Foster Wallace's archive, uh, he had in several instances noted that he had been reading Darcy Thompson's On Growth and Form. And I, I can't say uh, to what extent this influenced the writing of Infinite Jest. Um, however, in looking at the materials in the archive, I was reminded of another, of another novel, which is uh, the 1926 novel by Thomas Mann, Der Zauberberg, or um, The Magic Mountain. Uh, and in that particular uh, novel, there's, a, there's, a, there's an instance where Hans Kastorp, the protagonist, uh, go snow blind. He ventures outside of a sanatorium and is lost in the snow. Uh, and on one evening, once the air clears, he stares at the night sky. And here in this kind of like alpine uh, seclusion, he imagines, he imagines, sorry, a connection between the inner worlds of the human body and the great starry stuff beyond, right? He's literally connecting himself to the night sky and all the different kinds of like heavenly bodies that are kind of dangling in this, that are suspended in the night sky above him. So, and uh, Tomas Mann writes, quote, the innermost, the innermost recesses of nature were repeated mirrored on a vast scale in the macrocosmic world of stars whose swarms, clusters, groupings, and constellations pale against the moon hovered above the valley glistening with frost. I kept thinking about these innermost uh, recesses of nature while in the archive because I was looking at the handwriting of a man who was dead several years 
um, in a building that houses collections and works created by people long dead, some commemorated by their very death masks that were there in, the, in my workspace, right? Uh, or busts that kind of portray their faces in a deathly rictus. And this isn't the Ransom Center at the University of Texas, which is only an hour away where I am right now. Uh, the Ransom Center is created by oil money, a building whose limestone cladding bears the traces of shellfish and other crustaceans that have been dead for millions of years. That's all to say that while I was there reading and perusing these materials, I was part of this larger process of exchange of matter, one culminating in my writing of this piece and getting it published in this journal. So. Um, to follow up um, on this question of matter, and um, I, I should say that through this piece and through my work in general, what I'm trying to ask is how matter can tell a story. So to what you're asking um, about this idea of uh, half-life, or a half truth, um, you know, half life is the time that's required for a quantity to reduce to half of its initial value, if we are to take the term for what it is. And I really love the, the concept because the, in its original, which is a half life period and comes from the physicist Rutherford, he used that principle um, for a radioactive element's half-life in order to determine the age of rocks. And um, he did that by measuring the decay period of uh, radium in rocks to also find out the age of the Earth. So in regards to half-life and time, it, it becomes for me interesting that the discovery of radioactivity allows us to precisely know the age of the earth and you know the oldest uh, mineral that we know is a grain of uh, zircon in australia so you know that gives us the oldest rock unit but um you know radiology was invented in the 19th century and its first use was to estimate the age of fossils so now if we fast forward to the sites that I'm writing about um, where radioactive decay um, is, is used as a measure of time. So these new man-made fossils that I call the Whip and the Yucca Mountain, uh, here uh, radioactive waste becomes the measure of times past. So um, in, in the question of the, of the half truth, I think it's through the, um, through the writing and also producing these drawings that um, take actual proposed drawings for those sites, but of course implement them in, into rocks, you start to create a fiction around those sites, uh, but the fiction is based all on their, their material assemblies, but it speaks to um, how, how we can imagine them and how to grasp their scale and their immensity in time and in space. Um, which in a way leads, leads me to my next question, uh, which is how you produce these pieces, right? So I, I guess the two of you uh, to a certain extent uh, described uh, uh, both the setting and I mean, both the, the sort of intellectual setting and the physical setting in Enrique's case of, of you know, being sort of immersed in, in this vibe, right? When writing the piece. Um, and this is something that I think we are very interested in, uh, in Manifest, sort of uh, uh, trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, solicit uh, texts that are not only unconventional in content, but also in form. And I think your two pieces, uh, you know, belong to that uh, genre. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role of literary experimentation in your contributions uh, and try to also uh, speak to its uh, being a sort of vehicle for the cyber deciphering uh, cultures or places. Um, maybe I should say something about the, the, the history of this text also because it started uh -huh. roughly 12 years ago as an essay um, for a seminar that both Anthony and I were in. 
And so it started in a very different format um, and then was again reshuffled for a conference and then found, uh, I was really excited that it found its way into manifest in a different form. And then I produced the drawings just for manifest. And um, I think like uh, starting as a very academic paper into, um, I would say now is more um, a work of fiction. Um, and I should also say that this is the third conversation we have together with Manifest and we've had two other great conversations. And I, I also feel that the text is evolving as we speak and as we have these conversations. Um, but I was very interested in this idea of uh, what a field guide is uh, as something that you take with you uh, on the field and it kind of directs your attention to things that you might find there. So um, I, this is, this is not a typical field guide where you would look at trees or minerals or um, other, other specimens. So it, it, there is an absurdity to the whole uh, notion of using a field guide for something like this. Um, so I was also, and, and the text in, in some way engages very much with this absurdity also of the processes that are being contained and the kind of operations, the kind of uh, infrastructural operations that are taking place in this site. So both the field guide and the, the writing of the text, I think, are trying to grasp with this absurdity altogether. That's the, that's really. I mean, just to follow up on what Lydia is saying, which are, this which, which is really which is really uh, uh, totally in, inspiring, and like I, I want to write I want to write a field guide as well. You know, it's like, uh, and you know, on this topic of field guides, you know, and and literary experimentation, um, it's the lang you know, it's the language of of scientific method, right? So, you know, what is what is the what is the method of literary experimentation? You know, I, I don't know what it is for for David Foster Wallace, you know, and but I think you know, as you know, as a as a trained historian, I may be, I may be on on sure footing marginally so because I kind of feel like I'm at the margins of, you know, of, you know, of architectural history and that like I'm, I, I feel like I am, uh, uh, I'm really willing to look at other kinds of sources uh, that in order to write histories of, um, histories of, you know, of, of architecture, landscape and urbanism. Um, I think though that, uh, um, um, uh, one of the things that I'm really invested in as a historian, I said, is like kind of like expanding the kinds of materials that we consider um, when we when we write histories. And, you know, uh, when we look at novels, for example, I feel like novels are kind of like just like really kind of an underexplored aspect of writing architectural history, just because, um, you know, we ne do not necessarily consider a novel like a, a piece of fiction to be something that kind of like lets us know something about a particular moment in time says as much as say like an, an, archi an archival uh, document. But, uh, you know, being a, I, I did, you know, being a, a person who studied uh, history of science as an undergraduate, like in the early 1990s, you know, at the, at the death throes, you know, of, of, of theory, um, you know, in, in history departments, you know, 99% uh, of the texts that I read for history classes were novels. So my experience of history was already deranged, you know, and, and you know, in that respect, so that's really, really, really what I brought into uh, to my own uh, writing of history. But I don't think that's really that far off from, um, you know, what, you know, the way history has been understood, you know, the, the, the field of modern history, whether you know whether you want to pin it on to someone like Leopold von Hanke, for example, you know it was kind of like it was kind of like a reaction to you know this this inability to to um, you know to see what history was beyond the novels of Sir Walter Scott, you know, which to say that you know uh, you know several you know several hundred years ago the way that you knew history was through art which is through the historical novel the historical painting and the thing about novels though 
novels are, are really uh, are a really amazing popular art form right it's like you can't go to a museum to see you know a you know a painting by turner or you know or um or gary cole or who or whomever but you can carry a book with you you can carry this like very populous piece of art with you which is really it's it's really um it's really uh, an amazing uh kind of idea and I think maybe like uh, you know uh, uh, the book project that I'm working on, uh, which uh, which will which will which will come out hopefully sooner rather than later. You know, I do rely a lot on fictions and a lot of like you know uh, um, um, as a way to like help me understand my topics in the past. Um, and that's just because again, it's like I'm coming full circle to my own early training as a historian. It's like my way of, you know, of dealing with a particular topic is to kind of like read the words that people have committed to it. And that's what fiction like history is. These are words, right? I, I read a very, very amazing exchange between uh, uh, the, uh, the, liter the, uh, the uh, historian Robert Darnton and, um, and Nicholas Basbanes, who's this, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, he writes uh, books like he's like a, he, he's a popular historian, but he wrote this really amazing book called On Paper, which is a history of paper. Um, and Robert Darnton is a person, is a historian who's uh, uh, I believe he's still now the like the chief librarian at Harvard, but he's very very um, uh, does not like to consider like what does not like to consider um, is 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 kind of uh, let me put it this way. Um, um, is is a person who's very afraid to throw texts out, right? To basically say like, these are valuable texts, these are invaluable texts. For him, all texts are valuable. Any kind of piece of writing, whether it's a novel, whether it's a pamphlet or whatever, is important because it gives us a really important kind of like lens through which to view a particular moment in time, uh, you know. And you know, and as historians, you know, we should, you know, we should, you know, make time to look at all possible kinds of forms of writing, you know, and materials in order to understand something that that happened um, uh, a while ago. Because what writing does, what looking at fiction does, that uh, that uh, doesn't um, give us right now, it's telepresence that allows us to exist in another moment, you know, and that's a wonderful thing. So, following up on I think that beautiful layering that both of you uh, were just engaging in, Enrique and Lydia, and also in trying to keep with this idea of fiction, which I'm so glad was brought up by both of you, because of course fiction, I'm not gonna try to talk about its uh, potentially Greek roots, given the panel with two, two, people, two Greeks on the panel. But I think in terms of its Latin roots, right, goes all the way back to fingere, which right, means to give form or to shape. So I think something about the way in which we think about evidence and shaping it, uh, and, and uh, parallels uh, or overlaps with uh, novel writing is such an important, um, uh, I think, invaluable uh, way to look at, uh, at evidence and, and narrating the world. But, and it's certainly something that uh, gets done in the, the journal and, and building upon that. I was really then caught uh, or, or taken with the way in which you both pay such attention to, I think, what's on the surface or subsurface or what even lurks beneath or inside of, which is to say, how do we describe that which we cannot see? Uh, certainly, Lydia, you do this in your piece with radioactive material that's radiating out from the ground or at least an attempt to arrest its radiation. And Enrique, in, in your case, there's David Foster Wallace's description of the guts of a building and its HVAC system. So given your affinity, I think Lydia, for fossils or the production of future fossils, and uh, Enrique, in your case, your romance with air, could you each speak about how you describe and attend to that interface between surface and subsurface? Is it a kind of margin or marge, that kind of idea of that shoreline that you're, that you're engaging in your work? And, and uh, how do you try to write about those things which we perhaps, perhaps cannot always see or even experience? I'll just, I'll just, I mean, another, another really good question. Um, I, I think maybe, um, you know, as, as someone who, uh, you know, as a, as a uh, 
grapho and bibliomaniac. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, one of the one of the ways um, uh, when you say surface and subsurface. I think for me, it's like um, um, uh, I'd like to put it in more familiar terms, which is maybe like uh, between the personal and the universal. Perhaps it's like you know, it's a, it speaks more to like you know a personal methodology as opposed to something that's physical, which is kind of like I'm inverting the logic by which I began these comments, right? Um, and so, um, you know, and the thing is like, uh, you know, as I'm sure a lot of us do is like when we read something or we, we, we encounter a, a piece of art, it's like part of the draw is like, we hope to find something that, something of ourselves in it, right? It's like, you know, oh, this person is doing something that I hope I will do, or it's like, you kind of find some kind of inspiration, you know, or relief. Right, um, and one uh, one uh, um, one uh, writer who I, I've been turning to of light is the Mex the late Mexican writer Sergio Pitol. Um, he's an amazing writer, uh, uh, um, very inspirational to me um, because he was a biblio biblio like a bibliomaniac and a graphomaniac, also a lawyer and a diplomat. Uh, very very um, respons uh, responsible for translating a lot of Central European texts into Spanish uh, during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, the uh, um, uh, and his books are really interesting because it's like you know uh, uh, like a, it's a, a, if you want to know what a Mexican thinks, like what a Mexican citizen thinks of Tashkent or Samarkand, you know you read his books because it's like these like totally like you know very interesting accounts of like you know people from other parts of the Americas traveling, you know in parts of Central Asia. Um, uh, so he died recently, and his last book is called The Magician of Vienna, which is kind of like this literary um, autobiography, um, and it's called The Art of Flight. His last uh, sorry in this book, The Magician of Vienna. Uh, of Vienna, he talks about another book of his called The Art of Flight, which is about his peregrinations, you know, as a diplomat and a writer. And the thing is like flight, uh, in Spanish it's called El Arte de la Fuga, which is a, a kind of like a depletious term because it can mean both flight and fugue, right? Um, so, uh, um, but uh, there's a really, there's a really beautiful quote uh, by, um, uh, by Pitol, uh, where he says, like, what am I doing in these pages, you know, as he writes, um, uh, uh, and then um, he goes, I, I was obligated to transform myself into an almost unique character, as always the appearance uh, of a form resolved uh, in its own way, the contradictions inherent in a fugue. And then he says, writing to me is an act akin to weaving and unraveling many narrative threads that are continuously plated, uh, where nothing is closed and everything is conjectural. The reader will be the one who tries to clarify them to solve the mystery posed, to opt for some suggested opinions, sleep, delirium, wakefulness. Everything is words. Right, which is uh, which is I think it's just a, a it's a it's a really really it's to me it's a it's a very very kind of like a potent statement for kind of like you know using writer uh, the way writing can be an interface between surface and subsurface or personal and the universal right. So. Um, that, that's a really great question, and I love how you frame it, Enrique. I would say um, for me, even though I. I use fiction in the piece as a, as a literary form. I feel that I write as an architect. And what, what I mean by that is that I, I, I think of drawing tools and how they can be used in a text form. So um, the text really for me and the way I wrote it and it's intended to be read is almost like a stratigraphy drawing. So it's a section really. And uh, the text is a section through matter. So um, in that respect, it treats um, this interface that you're asking between the surface and the subsurface like an assembly where you start to, uh, to cut through it and uh, you start to describe it. And through this um, description, through peeling through all these um, layers of matter, which are, you know, rock, uh, volcanic rock or pure salt. And then you bump into uh, some thick layers of concrete and soil. And then you find air, uh, you find these tunnels and then titanium shields. And inside them you find transuranic waste. Um, 
so in by describing and kind of cutting through this assembly, you start to also uh, deciphering uh, these sites and uh, how they came to be, uh, what do they mean in terms of uh, deep time, uh, what does it mean to construct such a space in this kind of terrain. So I would say, yeah, the, the, the section for me is very um, important in the text, even though um, I, I'm not sure I produced a single section, but the, the text is written as a cut. Well, and, and to follow up on, on that and kind of this idea of deciphering, a, I think it's perhaps more uh, foregrounded in Rike's, but it's, it's a kind of latent motivation, I think, uh, Lydia, and yours as well, which is the role of meaning. And it, I would be curious to hear you both talk, especially given just what you mentioned about deciphering, Lydia, is how do you two wrestle with meaning in your, in your respective projects? Like, what role does that play in, in what you're trying to kind of excavate or exhume or, or draw uh, in your case, Lydia? Um, maybe um, I'd love to bring back this question of uh, meaning through this idea of writing history that also Enrique uh, was uh, talking about earlier. And Enrique, did you, in a quote that you were reading from the novel earlier on, did you say history is not for lawyers? Was mm -hmm. that the actual quote? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, you touched upon this in a really beautiful way, you know, about writing history and writing fiction and what kind of meaning emerges from this. And um, I had to think of uh, the ways of writing about history that uh, Nietzsche speaks about. So he, he makes these three categories that you have the monumentalist who actively studies these models of greatness that existed in the past. And you have the antiquarian historian who wants to preserve the past for the current and the future admiration. And then you have the critical historian who seeks to release, release us through destruction. So according to Nietzsche, the critical historian is judging, uh, interrogating and ultimately condemning the past. And um, I find that each of these models about writing history produces different meanings about the past and the present and also the future. And um, I would like to think that maybe through this uh, literary experimentation that, that we both are discussing today, um, and also in my case, producing drawings as a supplement to the text, Perhaps it's offering a different way of writing a story because it, it writes about the present, but with a mindset of a deep time. So perhaps it, it offers like a fourth way of, uh, of writing and uh, generating um, a different meaning that's not about preserving or um, for any admiration or distracting, um, but kind of combines all methods and offers a fourth one. That's that's I mean that's that's totally fascinating, uh, and um, you know I um, you know and uh, I I don't know I don't know <laughs> I don't know where I fit in that calculus that Nietzschean calculus that you that you kind of like you know delineated for me um, for us sorry um, you know I think it's like a um, I I read widely and deeply um, uh, I read uh, all kinds of things and I and I write in all kinds of modes. Uh, but when it comes to meaning, um, I think uh, I think there, a lot has to be said for um, you know for the value of the story, right? So, um, um, and uh, I'm recalling a, a collective freakout that was that was uh, inspired by uh, uh, William Cronin's uh, talk at the uh, at the at a at a at an annual meeting of the American Historical Association, where he basically said like you know more people know about history reading books reading um, uh, um, uh, books by um, God, I'm, God, I'm losing I'm losing track of his name the guy who wrote uh, 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 the guy who wrote uh, uh, the the book about uh, building his shed for writing. 
uh, and cooking. I forget, I, for, I can't believe I'm losing track of it. Michael Pollan, yeah, sorry. Michael, people will know no, more about the history of architecture because Michael Pollan's book, just as more people will know about, you know, different moments of, uh, of American history because of John Sayles films. It's like historians, where are you? It's like, you need to catch up. You know, it's like people are, you know, consuming these works. They're not reading your stuff, right? So, uh, um, and uh, uh, we might remember that Cronin uh, is an advocate of storytelling as a form of, uh, uh, as, a, as an approach to the writing of public history. Um, and he asks historians to uh, adopt the techniques of storytelling using plots endings and dramas. And when writing of historians uh, in his, in his, note, in his uh, remarks before this meeting, he, he notes how, quote, we configure the events of the past into causal sequences, stories that order and simplify those events to give them new meanings. We do so because narrative is the chief literary form that tries to find meaning in an overwhelmingly crowded and disordered chronological reality. And this is all well and good, uh, uh, but I'm not afraid to admit that uh, um, you know a lot of my inspiration, uh, you know, about the writing of history comes from this like very very slim book uh, written by the art historian Alexander Nemirov called Wartime Kiss. Uh, and in this, uh, it's this book, which is basically a collection of essays uh, based each based around a photograph that he found in an archive. For example, there's like there's this really uh, beautiful part of the book where he writes about these photographs of Jimmy Stewart and Olivia de Havilland flying model airplanes together, right? Um, there's a, um, he describes history writing as quote, butterfly atmospherics in slow drawn air. Sorry, let me, sorry, I didn't get that right. It's butterfly atmospherics, slow drawn in air. Right, um, uh, and it sounds like something that the novelist Vladimir Nabokov would write, um, who was um, uh, uh, he was a lepidopterist. You know, he collected butterflies as well. Um, so, uh, but like Nabokov, Nemirov uh, um, is also committed to something an elusive, uh, possibly dangerous in the writing of history. Um, and so, for example. Um, in, uh, uh, in the conclusion to this book, Wartime Kiss by uh, uh, Alexander Nemirov, he says something that is really music to my ears. Uh, he says, uh, when, it is when, it is when it is truly carried away, historical writing is a kind of flying. You know, and it's like, uh, you know, when I read that, I'm like, oh, you know, this is, you know, where have you been? It's like, this is what I've been wanting to, you know, you know read all this time. But uh, so this is a very, very long winded saying, very, very long winded way of saying that like, you know, there are many, there are many variants of meaning, you know, and uh, you know, for me, meaning is something that can be quite personal. Meaning is like, you know, finding, it's like kind of like finding a buoy, like in a large expanse of ocean. It's like, you're looking for something to grasp onto that'll kind of like save you in like this kind of like expanse when you're kind of like, you know, lost in this like, you know, see this expanse of literature and sources and stuff, you know, every now and then they'll find something that'll, that'll become like a lodestone or something like that. And you can just kind of go like, oh, this is, you know, this is, you know, what I've been looking for. And then suddenly you can kind of organize your whole, wor your whole world around it, you know, and it'll, you know, it might help you get things done a lot quickly, <laughs> a lot more quickly, hopefully, <laughs> so. And speaking of kind of expedience or, or, or speed, we, we have a question uh, from someone by the name of Ramon, who uh, says, um, thank you for the talk tonight. Uh, I don't have a copy of Manifest, but I'm going to buy one. Uh, that's nice to hear, Ramon. Uh, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, with respect to storytelling, Ramon is asking, and I'm just reading it now, I'm gonna to try to paraphrase it. Uh, Ramon is asking, well, in what ways can architects do a better job of telling stories and engaging larger audiences? Uh, speaking of uh, William Cronin, as you just brought up, Enrique, in what ways might architects do a better job of developing plot, dramaturgy, and in short, how to draw people, I think, in more to the world of architecture and why it's, as, as Ramon ends, why, why, why should people care about architecture and the built environment? That's a very big question. Yeah. 
Uh, I should I should defer to the to the to the architects in this panel <laughs> before I before I, I before I venture into that that treacherous uh, realm. But yeah, I, I, I know Lydia, you're 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 a designer. It's like uh, you're you're you know um, you uh, you have a very very you have a very very compelling you know way of writing it's like you know what is you know how does how does a field manual field in and uh, how does a field manual approach fit in into this kind of you know desire for uh this query from ramon asking you know how can you know architects you know make their work more accessible or, you know or expand it to wider audiences i will try to answer this is a re really really big question thanks ramon for um asking that. Um, I would say, um, you know, because I, I, I do work as an architect and I also, I, I write and, um, you know, for, for some time I felt that those two things were very separated, like the designing and also the writing. But um, I find that exactly through this idea of like writing a story, I think it brings these two things together, the drawing and perhaps the building and the thinking about uh, creating space and the writing. And I think it's, um, you bring those, those tools, like perhaps those analytical tools with you in the field or in the site or whatever it is, the project that one is, is engaged with. And um, I, I, I would say that personally, in in architecture projects i i try to write a story about the project uh, in the beginning and i also try to write a story in the middle of the project and a story in the end and i find that that way of and this is not the typical kind of um architectural project description that you would you know read in a publication i think nobody really wants to read my stories in that respect <laughs> Uh, they're mostly for me to develop uh, the idea about the project, but I think also they help you uh, define uh, what perhaps is important and the kind of narrative that maybe one, one wants to unfold in the project through time. Who do you want to engage with that, you know, could be also the flora or the fauna or the kind of relationships that may want may evolve in the space so i would say this is where the storytelling comes in if that partially answers it i think uh i mean that's 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 so that's 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 so uh that's, that's amazing and i you know it's it's to me like i i you know i I, I learn a lot by listening to architects, you know, and um, designers talk about, you know, their own design processes. Like, I feel like, you know, I feel like other, other fields that are committed to, to storytelling, you know, could, you know, could learn a lot, you know, from architects, you know, and designers at all scales. Um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, um, uh, most interesting, uh, or you, I don't know if it's useful, but it was definitely jarring and interesting things I heard about storytelling. And you know, in in my uh, in my uh, in my education is when I was uh, when I was in film school, uh, the the film Back of the Future was being discussed. You know, and it was one of these things where a professor said, you know, you know, summarize Back to the Future, you know, in one sentence. You know, and like people would say, you know, it's about time travel, whatever. And the professor goes like, no. It's about this guy who wants to play electric guitar at the prom, you know? And if you think about it, that's what the movie is. It's like all these like kind of like temporal circumlocutions. It basically culminates in Michael J. Fox playing guitar at the prom at the, you know, at the enchantment under the sea dance at the very end, which is, this is just a way of saying that it's like, you know, one of the best ways to be a storyteller is to be incredibly reductive, you know, about what you're doing. And I think, I think like architects are really, really good at being very reductive about what they do. You know, they're not like me who can like, you know, basically go into these like, you know, you know, weird Baroque kind of like, uh, 
you know, spinning webs, narrative webs and stuff, and just kind of like, kind of like talk myself to sleep, you know, uh, um, I find architects very, very inspiring, very fastidious about the way they present, you know, they present uh, ideas and stuff. And to me, like I said, it's super inspiring. So. And uh, perhaps as a, as continuing on that, I have a question from uh, Karen here, uh, which I'll try to paraphrase as well. So uh, I guess it relates to what we leave out and what we uh, include in the, in the conversation through our writing. So uh, Enrique, hearing uh, your description of Jules Verne's uh, own description of debris drifting across the globe and uh, Lydia's piece of radioactive matter buried uh, deep underground, I was wondering if your uh, concentration on uh, what was called literary experimentation uh, does not uh, allow a sort of uh, dissing or, or uh, leaving out of uh, pressing issues such as the environmental crisis, which these two pieces uh, in a way uh, touch upon. So perhaps if you could uh, refer to that. Well, um, it's, it's interesting because uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So, uh, um, um, you know, uh, um, the 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 part that I found um, the part that I found in um, in the archive that got published in Manifest is is th there are a lot of things like that you know there are a lot of things that eventually didn't make it you know into into uh, into the the final the final version of Infinite Jest you know and there were a lot, there was a lot of intervention of course there were editors at play um, but one of the things that I really want to I really want to I, I, wanna, I really wanna point out about about Infinite Jest is you know as much as you know people as you know as as, as as it's kind of celebrated or described as this kind of like you know high point of let's call it you know late modern or postmodern you know literature um, it's a science fiction novel that's about an environmental catastrophe at heart you know and the novel um, the novel takes place. Uh, yeah, the, the the majority of the action takes place in a, in, uh, in this uh, part of Boston that's being con uh, continuously bombarded by by a waste that's being thrown over the U.S. Canada border as it is kind of this kind of like toxic war, like the U.S. and Canada are kind of lobbing toxic waste over over the borders via catapults uh, to each other. So it's 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 very it's like this weird dystopian thing, and then it's also um, uh, uh, and also a lot of it occurs like especially the the, the characters when they're young, they're all uh, at a tennis academy in Arizona. So it's all about kind of like these like kind of pressurized environments and you know and like the pressure of competition that occurs in these pressurized pneumatic environments you know you know in 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 in, in uh, a very very unbearably hot arizona um so um was he writing was wallace intentionally writing about environmental catastrophe no i mean that's his way of understanding or that's the way that he's getting to uh through his art like his the way that he was writing about kind of like environmental conditions was like a way of propelling uh the the uh the storyline can we use infinite jest as a way to understand you know how people viewed environmental catastrophes like in the late 1990s um, there would have to be a lot of there would have to be a lot of critical gymnastics in order to really really um, to really uh, think about that. But it's like when you consider the novel, um, for example, uh, that was partially written on 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 pieces of notebook paper, and then it was also written on a computer. Parts of it were written on a computer as well. You know, there are things to be. Uh, there are stories to be told about kind of like the exchange of matter, you know, of digital and physical matter and the composition of this particular, of this particular novel. Um, so, uh, um, and that brings another, another really uh, um, important issue, which is when you're talking about, uh, which is about uh, what's left in and left out, there's a whole issue of of dealing with voices that have been excluded from the writing of these narratives, right? Um, and then, fortunately, um, there are outlets. Uh, there are outlets. There are writers who are dedicated, and historians, of course, designers as well, uh, curators, conservators, people who are devoted to this very issue. Um, uh, the excerpt from Sergio Pitol's uh, book that I that I that I shared with you comes from uh, the English translation comes from this very, very small press in Dallas called Deep Vellum Press, which is dedicated to basically 
resuscitating these uh, uh, unheard voices, at least untranslated voices, and kind of uh, uh, making them available to English audiences. And then also, uh, I should say that uh, um, some of the other some of the other things that I uh, that I read or kind of shared with you are part of this. Uh, part of this, uh, of this uh, publishing initiative called the Dahlke Archive, which is spearheaded at the University of Illinois, uh, which is basically they uh, take novels that have basically gone under the radar and publish them, and publish them at, a, you know, at a lower price point. Um, you know, there is a lot of room for similar uh, writings about architecture as well. You know, and my hope uh, as a, you know, as a, as, as a person who's trained in architectural history, who writes architectural history, who's devoted to writing architectural history, but is really invested in the way architectural history operates, uh, you know, in the world at large, you know, I would hope that, you know, I would definitely be, uh, um, I would definitely uh, be a person who would advocate for including more writings about the built environment into these kinds of like, uh, into these kinds of uh, initiatives to kind of like, uh, um, promote voices that are previously unheard you know and I think that's actually one of the really uh, one of the really uh, wonderful things about a publication like manifest it is kind of like this vehicle that really allows uh, that is really the way it is set up you know and uh, you know um, as, as the publication goes on where it can accommodate and really really kind of like expand you know into its own version of weather, weathering immensity an immensity of voices critical voices that can be incorporated into its like general outlook as well Um, I would say, and, you know, Enrique, you, I couldn't um, express it better, like what you said about Manifest and the way it brought together all these voices. And um, thanks to Anthony and Dan, and I, 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 I'd like to talk maybe about footnotes. And because you both suffered from my numerous footnotes in the text. And um, I think um, maybe that's something also that runs very much through Infinite Jest, right, Enrique? Like the, the footnotes are almost, I don't know if they're half of the novel, but it's a pretty extensive body of footnotes there too. So in terms of what, what you leave uh, outside the main body of the text, or I mean, the, the text that I wrote, it is really about an environmental disaster. Um, it's just not uh, in the main, let's say, field guide format is not presented as such. Of course, this is implicit and uh, in every kind of description, every event, every infrastructure that the text is writing about, um, there is a corresponding footnote, you know, how, for instance, um, in Carlsbad, one of the sites, um, this was also, um, the, the waste was generated by decades of nuclear research and bomb making. So it's heavily, the, the site was already heavily bombed. So I would say I, I used very much the, the footnotes in the text to kind of present all these facts, all these historical facts, but the text itself uh, takes a very different form altogether. So, the combination, I would say, of this field guide or literary form, the drawings and the footnotes is a way to open up different avenues to, to discuss an environmental disaster. So the drawings perform one role, they have the, the kind of the visual, the immensity, the very bold, the text itself guides you sectionally through these sites. And then you have the footnotes that speak about all the the hard and the tough facts about the site itself. Um, so yeah, about what one leaves out. And um, I, I just think that there are ways to compose perhaps a text that uh, weaves these different, um, different narratives. And maybe on, on that note, on, uh, on footnotes, uh, no pun intended, uh, but uh, is a good place to end. But also, I just want to be clear, Lydia, uh, we very much enjoyed your footnotes uh, throughout the piece and uh, making sure that they were the, the most up-to-date uh, uh, as we put together the journal. 
I'd like to thank uh, Nader Terani, uh, Lydia Calipoliti, uh, uh, Mauricio uh, at Cooper Union, um, and of course, uh, a thank you to Lydia Sinocala, Enrique Ramirez, and uh, a special thank you to the wizard, uh, AKA designer known as Tal Erez for uh, the production uh, of this tonight. It's really wonderful to get to work with Tal. And we really appreciate the opportunity as Dan had mentioned at the very beginning to do this event at Cooper, not only because uh, Lydia Sinagala is, a, is an alumna of Cooper Union, uh, but also because we have a long standing, uh, I guess, uh, love not just as architects, but also manifest because I believe one of our first launches in person was at Cooper some time ago. So we also very much look forward to the opportunity, hopefully when issue number four comes out of doing something in person uh, at Cooper Union. But again, I really want to thank all of you that tuned in. And of course, again, uh, to everyone at Cooper for helping put this together. It really means a lot to us and we're extremely grateful. So thank you very much.